Today we are with Ms. Manon Aubry at the European Parliament. Ms. Aubry is the co-chair of the United European Left and Nordic Green Alliance. First of all, thank you very much for sitting down with us and doing this exchange. We appreciate this very much. You're welcome. So, uh, your background as an activist shows that you have strong um, idealistic convictions and you are willing to stand up for them. However, some of your peers have expressed doubt over whether you will be able to transform your convictions into actual policies. So it would be interesting to us, for us uh, to know how exactly does your vision for Europe look like and what do you hope to achieve as an MEP? I wonder whether they've asked so because I'm a new MEP, because I'm coming from civil society, because I'm a woman, because I'm younger than 30 years old. This might look like handicaps when you get to a building like here and a parliament that is completely cut from the real world. But I think this is precisely this connection with the real world, which is actually an added value for a group like ours. Um, because I can, in my two months experience here in the European Parliament, you can see how everything is done to cut you from the reality. Uh, and that's a strong impression I have. And we might be a small group, but we're a group first is connected to the outside world, but second, that brings a vision for Europe. We're the only group when we were formed at the beginning of the mandate to propose a list of 10 points for the Commission, like we do politics. And of course, we have a vision of Europe that needs to be completely reshifted to deliver about climate change, to deliver about tax justice. For example, we know there are tax havens within the European Union, like Ireland, like the Netherlands, and we need to fight them. And we, need, we know that the rules that prevent us from doing this, and the role of MEPs is very limited. And we will, we will work over the coming years to bring about this vision of Europe. But also there are things, very concretely speaking, that we can win, free trade agreements. There will be a big debate over the coming months within the European Parliament on the free trade argument with Mercosur, for example. And we think this is very dangerous for our planet. This is dangerous for our um, agricultures here in uh, our farmers here in Europe. So, and we think we can have a majority within the parliament and we'll be leading the fight. This morning I was in the conference of presidents in the European Parliament and I've asked for a, a debate to be held next week uh, in the parliament. And the socialists refused it. They refused it because they are divided and we are going to work on them and we are going to make, we are going to voice ourselves and we're going to bring the external world to put pressure on uh, MEPs because they tend to forget where they're coming from. And I think being a young MEP from the uh, civil society and first MEP here, I won't forget this. Yeah, okay. Um, next, let's uh, talk a bit about Brexit. Uh, while the UK uh, has always been very keen on free trade and economic integration, they have been less so on political integration. Um, now, since we're assuming that Brexit is going to happen, uh, how will this impact uh, the future of the EU? Will it make further integration maybe easier because the UK is not there to argue against it? Or will it inspire similar attempts to leave by other members and maybe jeopardize the entire integrity of the European Union? Well, first, no one knows what's going to happen. And that's a big challenge because from one day to another, the, the news about Brexit and the way it happens is actually changing. I think to know, to try to um, yeah, anticipate what's going to happen, we first have to understand what happens and why did the British citizens vote to uh, leave the EU. One can, can regret that they were doing so, but we do respect sovereignty. If they did vote to leave, we have to let them leave. But of course, we have big worries around this. Either there's a no deal and then the British will suffer a hard price of um, something that they, uh, was hard to measure for them uh, and they will suffer the hard price because uh, the poorest will be hit the most. Or another worry is that there is a deal, but that deal is actually one of the worst free trade agreements that the UK in a way has the benefits of the EU without the cost of it. We know as well that the UK is taking a very dangerous trend 
to become a tax haven, a new tax haven right at the border of the EU. They already decreased the corporate income tax rate from 19% to 17%. Uh, 17%. In France, it was 33, now it's down to 28 and will be down to 25. You can see the impact of this. And the EU is becoming a sort of a race to the bottom, where it should be a race to the top, to harmonize and at the top, to be able to protect people. So once we've understood well the symptoms of Brexit, we can also um, uh, shift the orientation of the EU to make sure this situation doesn't happen anymore because I don't think any Europeans, any MEP even wants this situation to happen anymore because it's so blurry, we, we don't know where it's leading us. Yeah, interesting points. Um, especially because the, U yeah, the UK is, is uh, the second biggest economy and the, uh, third big has the third biggest population, it will definitely have an impact and uh, it will Leaving, if, if the UK leaves, it will definitely be the biggest blow to the aspirations of the EU in its history. Um, so how should the EU um, continue uh, with um, uh, further enlargement, especially towards uh, Western Balkans? Or would that be maybe politically unwise because uh, extending too far, too fast would maybe make uh, the problems that the EU is facing today only worse? For me, the question is a bit of rhetoric, like are you in favor of enlargement or not? It depends for what. And I think we should learn from the mistake of the past enlargement, is that we enlarged the EU without having set the common rules that would uh, help us precisely to avoid that race to the bottom. And I was talking about corporate income tax rates right before. Well, we have Hungary that has a 9% corporate income tax rate. This is precisely the race to the bottom that we want to avoid. And I think the same rules should now apply for another enlargement, whatever the country is. First, the EU has to work on changing its rule, on ensuring that social justice and tax justice and climate is at the core of its objective before it gets new countries in. Otherwise, you just you just enlarge the competitions. You have even more competitors. And the ones who will suffer it are workers. Well, we know with the posted, direct, the posted workers directive, for example, that anyone from any country in the EU can work in another country. I'm in favor of it, but with the lowest social protection possible. The EU should not be about lowering the social protection, but rather the country. So first we have to work on those rules and unfortunately, it's not the direction we're currently taking. Okay, you're making good points. Um, now let's move on to uh, human rights. Uh, as someone with a degree in human rights and hands-on experience in two African countries that have experienced widespread human rights violations uh, for a very long time, uh, it would be of great interest to us uh, to hear your opinion on the current EU migrant uh, policy, especially with regards to uh, the deal that was made with Turkey in 2016. Well, the, the problem um, is that this deal is presented as a deal that protects human rights, but it does everything but protect human rights. And what the EU is doing over the last few years is externalizing its management, its handling of migration issues, saying, well, Turkey, you have to deal with it and we give you money for it. But that's not the way to do it because the objective of the EU this way is to close as much as possible the borders around the EU. As if, as if migrants that come at the border of the EU have a choice. As if they were, you know, um, you know one day they are living in DRC and they're telling themselves, oh, life must be better in the EU. But who wants to, to cross the whole world, risk their life? if they have no other choice to do it. So I think we need a bit more dignity, a bit more humanity in the way we handle migration issues and migration policies. And the answer of the EU is to close the border even more. And that's the objective of the deal with Turkey. And to let people die in the Mediterranean Sea. This is the migration policy at the moment in the EU and it's the sign, like the, it's even worse now with the last sign that the, of the new commission. They, they, they will have a commissioner in charge of protecting the EU uh, way of life. 
that deals with the migrants, the, the migration issue, meaning that the migration issue is related to and threatens the European way of life. I think this is dangerous and we don't fight the far right with using their rhetoric, their words and their fury. I think it's very serious and we're up to fight for it. Yeah, the uh, human rights concerns are definitely um, uh, important. Um, the EU uh, started to um, curb the influx of migrants, especially because of these uh, uh, right-wing populists who gained a lot of ground uh, since 2015. Uh, in my home country of Germany, this led to the creation of the AFD as we know it today, a right-wing populist party that, restrict, uh, that strictly opposes any non-native element in German society. In recent uh, regional elections, they managed to attract as much as 30% of the vote. And uh, now the question is, how do you think is it possible to manage the humane and decent treatment of refugees and migrants while also keeping these right-wing elements in check? I think, again, we should have a good diagnosis of why the far right is increasing. I'm from France, so I know unfortunately very well how important it is, is, is the far right and how dangerous they are. But what they're doing is that they're pointing out at immigrants and saying it's their fault if your salary is decreasing, it's their fault if there are inequalities. And this is precisely what we have to find because the, 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 the reason why there are rising inequalities in the EU is austerity measures, is uh, privatization of essential services like public health all across the EU. This is not um, this is not about migration. So I think we need to find on several fronts. First, save lives. Might seem obvious, but there are thousands of people dying in the Mediterranean Sea. We keep in mind that no, there's not a big flow of migrants coming to Europe. It's only 2%. 2% of the whole EU um, uh, citizens. Plus, it is on the decrease. And there's only one number that is on the rise. That is the number of people dying in the Mediterranean Sea. And in proportion, it's increasingly, um, uh, it's, it's really on the, on the short increase. So we need to save lives to have an a EU, uh, a, a EU mission in the Mediterranean Sea to save lives. Second, we need to analyze why migrants are coming. We do have a responsibility. Climate change, there will be 140 million of people leaving uh, their countries by uh, 2050 because of climate change fight climate change, the EU has a responsibility, it's one of the areas in the world that pollute the most, free trade agreements, etc. We need to understand war, of course, we, a lot of our countries do participate in wars across the world. And last but not least is um, if we do stop the competition between people, between companies, between everything, which is what the EU is about, well then we'll give the, be the best answer possible to people and therefore prevent them from voting for the far right. I think this is a, an ambitious agenda, but it's how we should deal with it. Yeah, definitely. It sounds very interesting. Um, now let's move on um, to another uh, human rights topic. Uh, if we look at Iran, uh, we have a similar balancing problem. We have on the one side uh, human rights, which are continuously violated by the regime. On the other hand side, uh, we have the uh, nuclear deal, which reduces the risk of Iran developing nuclear weapons. Um, now this deal um, eases many of the economic sanctions that were previously in place and this allowed for economic growth um, and, the, uh, and it, this might help the regime to further uh, perpetuate its grip to power. So how do you see the situation? Should the EU uphold the agreement or return to a policy of confrontation? Well, I think the deal is not a bad deal. The deal is about the conditions in which we ensure that Iran doesn't produce nuclear weapon, and we should be very careful about what Trump is doing because he's precisely the one who is putting everything on fire. Uh, there was a deal, and you know, international organizations said that the deal was respected by Iran. One could say that the deal doesn't go as far. One could say that we need to confront Iran more, but they still believe in diplomacy. And I think we should use the weight of the EU 
to counterbalance Trump being very stupid and act and acting, taking a lot of risk for, for, for the future of our world and talking about nuclear weapons is quite a serious topic and taking some risk for all of us. And that's what Trump is doing at the moment and he's playing around it and should be careful about it. Yeah, thank you very much, Ms. Aubrey. Uh, this was uh, very interesting. Thank you very much for hosting us here and we wish you all the best for your time you. here in Brussels.